In this video, we'll learn information cascade, threshold, and collective behavior. In the previous video about the madness of crowds, we briefly mentioned information cascade. It is one of the reasons that crowds sometimes collectively generate madness instead of collective wisdom. There are many real-life examples of information cascades, such as standing ovation, protests and riots, voting, segregation, public opinion on many issues, and adopting a new product or a behavior. What is an information cascade exactly? In network theory, it means that a number of people make the same decision in a sequential fashion. Here, sequential is the key. It is not that people make a decision at the same time. An information cascade takes place when people make decisions sequentially. Some information cascades take place rapidly, like the protest last summer took place within a matter of weeks. Other information cascades happen very slowly. It may take generations for some ideas and social norms to become universal, such as women's suffrage. In Duncan Watt's book titled Six Degrees, The Science of a Connected Age, he argued that all information cascades have something in common. That is, once an information cascade starts, it becomes self-sustaining. In the previous video on epidemics and infodemics, we introduced R0. R0 indicates how contagious a disease is. It is the expected number of new infectors directly generated by an infected individual for a given time period. If R0 is greater than 1, it means one infector can infect more than one susceptible individual, so an outbreak is self-sustaining unless effective control measures are implemented. An information cascade is very similar. Once an information cascade starts, whatever flows in the social network will find a host to adopt a new behavior or viewpoint. With the right structure of social networks, an initial spark can percolate through the social networks, even when the initial spark is very small. Here is an example. You want to walk across the street. Do you wait for the walk signal? Of course. That's what we were told since we were very young. Here are some scenarios. The first scenario. There is no car, no other pedestrians, no street camera. You are the only soul on the street. Do you still wait for the walk signal? The second scenario. There is no car, but 10 pedestrians waiting for the walk signal with you. For some reason, one pedestrian starts walking across the street, but others remain still. Do you wait for the walk signal or start walking? The third scenario, there is no car, but 10 pedestrians waiting for the walk signal with you. For some reason, seven pedestrians start walking across the street one after the other. Do you still wait for the walk signal or start walking? If you start walking, you are part of an information cascade. What are the conditions to set off an information cascade? There are two primary conditions. First, a decision has binary options. In the last video of the madness of crowds, I mentioned that to make a decision, you need a choice set. In the case of an information cascade, your choice set is very narrow, either yes or no, whether to join a protest or not, whether to support a political position or not, whether to vote for a candidate or not, whether to buy the new product or not, and whether to adopt a new behavior or not. The second condition of an information cascade is that people make decisions sequentially, and each person can observe the choices made by those who acted earlier. 
For example, at the Second Continental Congress, delegates from the 13 colonies voted on the resolution for independence. They voted sequentially. New Hampshire voted yes. Rhode Island voted yes. Massachusetts voted yes. The delegates voted one by one. The delegates could observe the votes made by those who voted earlier. A different decision-making process is how a pope is selected. Secret ballot is used so that you don't necessarily know who voted for whom before you cast your vote. Why is sequential decision making so important in an information cascade? To answer this question, let's introduce a construct called threshold. It means the percentage of other people who must make the same decision before you. For example, we have ten people in a social network. They are the nodes in the network. Everyone is connected to one another. A new idea is introduced to the network, and each node will decide whether he or she wants to adopt the idea. What you see on the screen is a distribution of nodes threshold. Abby has a threshold of zero. It means Abby needs zero individual to adopt the idea before she does. It's probably because Abby is very independent-minded. She is very comfortable with making her decision without knowing how other people make their decisions. Abby doesn't need assurance from others. Another possibility is that Abby has been thinking about a similar idea for a long time. Once the idea is presented to Abby, she immediately decides that she'll adopt it. It is also possible that the idea is from Abby's boss, who is a bully. So Abby decides not to argue with the boss and simply adopts the idea, even though she knows it is the stupidest idea she's ever heard. Regardless, Abby has a threshold of zero. Next, let's look at Blake. Blake has a threshold of ten percent. It means for Blake to adopt the idea, he needs at least ten percent of the people in his social network to adopt the idea before he does. Since Abby has already adopted the idea, Blake is comfortable with adopting it. Cruz has a threshold of twenty percent. It means for Cruz to adopt the idea, he needs at least twenty percent of the people in his social network to adopt the idea before he does. Since Abby and Blake have already adopted the idea, so Cruz is comfortable with adopting it. David has a threshold of thirty percent. It means for David to adopt the idea, he needs at least thirty percent of the people in his social network to adopt the idea before he does. Since Abby, Blake, and Cruz have already adopted the idea, so David adopts the idea as well. Do you see the pattern here? If a people in the network makes the decision of adopting an idea sequentially, with the distribution of threshold, it doesn't need all ten people to initiate an information cascade. In this case, how many people does it take to set off an information cascade? It actually takes only one person, and that person is Abby. Now let's consider a different distribution of threshold. This time, the range of the distribution of threshold is much narrower. J has the highest threshold of fifty percent. Will an information cascade take place in this social network? The answer is no. 
Abby will be the only one who adopts the idea because Abby has the lowest threshold of zero, meaning she is comfortable with adopting the idea without knowing what other people think. Blake has the second lowest threshold at twenty percent. It means for Blake to adopt the idea, he needs at least twenty percent of the people in his network to do so. Right now, we only have Abby. Even though there is a social tie between Abby and Blake, Blake would not adopt the idea because it doesn't meet Blake's threshold. The idea cannot travel further in the network because people are not ready for it. With what we've learned about social networks, how to start an information cascade. You first need to know the social structure of your target population. Who is connected with whom? What's the tie strength of each pair of nodes in the network? If a network is not well connected, the cascade is constrained. But it is not enough to know just the social structure. You also need to pay attention to node attributes. A key attribute here is node threshold. The threshold model was also used to study the collective behavior of Riot. For example, a hundred people are gathering in front of the city hall, protesting against the city's policy X. You are one of them, but being an educated, civilized resident, you understand that reason and dialogue are a better approach than violence. In a protest, you are faced with two options: a violent protest or a peaceful one. On your way to the protest, you've made your decision to participate in a peaceful protest. What about other protesters in the crowd? In any crowd, people tend to make their decisions as they observe how other people behave. Everyone has a threshold: the percentage of other people who must make the same decision. To illustrate what would happen, Mark Granovetta developed a distribution of each protester's threshold. There are a hundred people, and everyone has a unique threshold. Here, I only display ten people's threshold as an example. With this distribution of threshold, can you imagine what would happen to this crowd? Mr. Violent has a threshold of zero. He will riot even if no one else does. He starts throwing things and smashing windows of retail stores. Then another protester who has a threshold of one joins Mr. Violent. Together they meet another protester's threshold, which is two. One after the other, the entire crowd ends up joining the riot, with Mr. Saint working very hard to remain calm and peaceful. Imagine in a different city called City B, there is a crowd with the same size. Everything is the same. The only difference is very minor. That is, nobody has a threshold of two. And the two people have a threshold of three. This is a very minor difference. It is doubtful that a psychological test or statistical model can tell the two crowds apart. What would happen in City B? Again, Mr. Violence starts throwing things and smashing windows. Then another protester who has a threshold of one joins Mr. Violent. Next is where the two crowds part their ways. In the crowd of City B, nobody has a threshold of two, and the two people have a threshold of three. Two rioters are not enough to create an information cascade. How would observers, such as journalists, politicians, and other city residents, interpret the different collective behavior? In City A, there is an all-out riot, but in City B, it is a mostly peaceful protest. 
The media coverage may say protesters in City A were angrier, police officers in City A were more aggressive, or politicians in City B responded better. But in Granovetta's threshold model of collective behavior, the only difference was one protester's slight change in personal threshold. The threshold model was also used to study segregation. In an article titled "Dynamic Models of Segregation," published in 1971, Thomas Schelling used the threshold to describe the dynamics of segregation motivated by individual interactions in America. If you look at American cities, you usually see a lot of segregation between different segments of society. You can see neighborhoods of people in different racial groups, cultural backgrounds, religions, sexual orientations, and income. But if you ask residents, they would say, "I'd love to have a more multicultural setting in my own neighborhood." So, how to explain this contradiction? The first explanation is that they say so out of social desirability bias. We tend to present ourselves in a socially desirable way. If you ask people, "Do you have racial bias?" you are unlikely to get an honest answer. Many discussions on racial bias are about how we are the victims of racial bias, but not that we have racial bias toward other people. But we all have racial bias, whether you recognize it or not. It's a different matter. Thomas Schelling built a segregation model to explain the makeup of the neighborhoods. Consider the grid here; it's a city. In the city, there are red and green residents. Here we have two thousand households. For each house, you have next door neighbors on all sides, and we randomly distribute the two thousand households on this grid. If a red color household says that I want fifty percent of my neighbors to be like me in red color, and a green household says that I want fifty percent of my neighbor to be like me in green color, so fifty percent is the threshold. If the actual red and green makeup of your neighbors is below the fifty percent threshold, residents are unhappy. In this randomly distributed model, the actual percentage of similarity between you and your next door neighbors is 49.9 percent, very close to your threshold, but it is still 0.1 percent short. So there are 41.8 percent of residents are unhappy. It means 41.8 percent of households threshold is not met. Here is the rule: If you are unhappy, you can move to the next free space that meets your threshold. Over time, what's going to happen? Since you can move to a neighborhood where your next door neighbors are like you, over time, the red green makeup of the neighborhood gets more and more similar, and more and more residents are happier. But the neighborhoods. Become more and more segregated. In this simulation, 87.5 percent of the residents have their neighbors who are like them. What about we lower people's thresholds? Let's say 26 percent. This means that you are more tolerant of how dissimilar your next door neighbors are. Let's set up the percentage similar wanted to 26 percent in Schelling's segregation model. In the beginning, the similarity rate is 50.7 percent, and 13.4 percent of residents are unhappy. Over time, the similarity rate reaches 66.3 percent, and everyone is happy. Let's compare the two models with 50% and 26% thresholds. 
the lower the threshold, the more tolerant of dissimilarity, the less segregated a city is. What about we make a very minor change of threshold? This time we change it from twenty six percent to twenty five percent. It is a very small change of people's personal threshold at an individual level, only one percent. Do you think we will see big changes in collective behavior of city segregation? Let's run the model. Over time, the similarity rate drops to fifty nine point nine percent. What does it mean? One percent of change at the individual level leads to about six percent of change in city segregation. Let's try two more scenarios. This time, we increase the threshold to seventy five percent. It means people are highly intolerant of dissimilarity. If less than seventy-five percent of their next-door neighbors are not like them, they'll move away. Let's run the model. Over time, the city is ninety-nine point nine percent segregated. What about raising the threshold by one percent to seventy-six percent? Do we see a big change at the collective level? You will find the model keeps running, and the similarity rate drops to fifty-three point three percent, but the unhappy rate increased to eighty-four point one percent. How do you interpret the results? One percent of change at the individual level, from seventy-five percent to seventy-six percent, leads to the collective outcome of a highly segregated city to a desegregated one. Recall emergence. We've talked about it repeatedly in this semester. What's emergence? The collective behavior is more than the sum of its parts. Those minor changes at an individual level can lead to drastically different collective behavior as a whole, and those minor changes at the individual level are considered as tipping points. The drastic change of a collective behavior is called emergence or phase transition. Thomas Schelling's segregation model. Offers a compelling explanation of individual motives and collective behavior. Next time, when you hear someone says, "We need to do it because other people are doing it," you need to stay alert. You may lose yourself if you simply follow the crowd. Just because other people jump off the cliff doesn't necessarily mean you should jump off the cliff. The threshold can also be used to explain many social changes. Sometimes the seemingly minor change can set off an unpredictable large-scale reaction. That minor change is the last straw that breaks the camel's back. Another name for this effect is called the butterfly effect. A small change in an initial state can cause large differences in a later state. A butterfly flapping its wings can cause a tornado several weeks later. Have you noticed that in this video about information cascade, we haven't talked about the merit of the information or idea that is transmitted in social networks? If the idea introduced to the network is a good idea for the greater good, then a positive change will follow. It is also possible that the idea is a really bad one. In this case, a spiral of silence will follow. No one is willing to speak up. Let's now consider what's transmitted in the networks is an innovative idea or a great product. In a successful cascade, we tend to overvalue the merit or the actual attribute of the idea. The social structure and the distribution of threshold are more important than how innovative the idea is. I'm not saying that you don't need to come up with good ideas. 
But for an idea to become popular or become a policy, the merit of the idea is not enough to set off an information cascade. Do you still remember the difference between a normal distribution and a power law distribution? The quality of an idea tends to follow a normal distribution. There are a few very good ideas. And a few very bad ideas, and most of the ideas are okay, but the success of an idea tends to follow a power law distribution. This means very few ideas are extremely successful or popular, but most of the ideas are on the long tail. They are constrained within small social circles. Here is a question for you. Is it just a coincidence that many networks follow a power law distribution? The painting of Mona Lisa is quite popular. It is one of the most paintings in the world. About eighty percent of the visitors to Louvre went there primarily because of the painting. Mona Lisa is indeed a masterpiece. But there are so many other masterpieces. In fact, for a very long time, Mona Lisa was just one of many masterpieces. The painting was finished by Da Vinci in 1519. The King of France then bought it and kept it in his private residences. After French Revolution, the painting was moved to Louvre. But it didn't attract disproportionate attention, though. In the early 20th century, there was an employee at Louvre who was a proud Italian. He believed that Mona Lisa should be displayed in Italy, not France, because Da Vinci was born in Italy. That Louvre employee stole the painting and kept it in his apartment. Two years later, he was arrested. He was treated like a hero by the Italians, and Mona Lisa was shown all over Italy before it was returned to France. The French was captivated by the stories of the stealing and recovery of the painting. That event propelled the painting out of the long tail of a power law distribution. The painting has enjoyed a meteoric rise to fame. Nowadays, people tend to think that Da Vinci's extraordinary painting techniques led to the fame of the painting. But is it possible it's the other way around? Is it possible that because of the fame, people pay more attention to Mona Lisa, and therefore having more appreciation for the painting techniques? After all, Da Vinci was not the only artist who used those painting techniques in his time. There are other artworks that are as good as Da Vinci's. The same applies to people's performance on most of the tasks. Your performance is about your capability and talent, but your success. It's a social event. If you look at successful people in any industry, you may find that their capability is a little bit better than the average, but not exponentially better. When it comes to their success, popularity, and income, they are exponentially higher than the rest. A standing ovation is a better indicator of social popularity than the quality of performance. How to set off an information cascade and make a crowd behave in the same way? You arrange a few people standing in the crowd. After the performance, they start clapping together. It doesn't take long for others to start clapping. Not long after, the entire crowd clapping their hands in the same way. Why? Because the first few people's clapping was louder than anyone else, so their clapping is obviously observable. Their clapping then drags someone else into clapping with them sequentially. 
As a result, more people are likely to join them, boosting the signal even further and dragging more people in. It doesn't take long for the entire crowd to clap together. Sometimes you may feel the speech was just okay or even boring and cliche. But then, one person sitting next to you stood up and clapped their hands, and then five people around you began to stand up and clap their hands, and then fifteen people. If you choose to sit still, you may feel you are an ungrateful, entitled brat. The citation of scientific papers is more about the success of a paper, but less about the quality of a paper. Researchers examined four million authors and twenty-six million scientific papers across fifteen years and a hundred and eighteen scientific disciplines. In the previous video of scale-free networks, I mentioned that citation networks are scale-free. What are the properties of scale-free networks? There is Matthew effect. The rich get richer. That's exactly what happened to the citation networks over 15 years. The top 1% most cited papers continue to reap the benefit of the Matthew effect. One more implication of scale-free networks and the Matthew effect: in social settings, our behaviors and decisions are dependent on the choices made by the people around us. If we apply the Matthew effect in the scale-free networks to explain social behavior and the spread of ideas, it doesn't take many nodes to set off information cascades. As long as we allow the network to grow and people, as social creatures, to follow the principle of preferential attachment, the social networks that serve as the conduit of the spread of behaviors, ideas, and information will eventually grow into the scale-free networks. Here comes another question: How to identify those very few nodes that have the potential to create an information cascade? Can we randomly select the nodes in the network and tell other nodes the selected nodes are popular? The answer is yes. Providing feedback can produce a power law distribution. When something becomes popular, it is sometimes not necessarily due to its merits, but because we tell others that something is popular. A worse product can become popular if it reaches a certain critical audience size before its competitors do. In hindsight, would the Harry Potter books again sell hundreds of millions of copies? Or would they become one of many books that don't generate much revenue for publishers? Researchers conducted an experiment that shows random effects early in the process can play a role in the dynamics of information cascades. To do so, researchers created a music download website. On the website, they offered 48 obscure songs of different qualities, written by actual artists. Visitors never heard those songs before. They went to the website to listen to the songs and then evaluated the quality of the songs. The visitors were also shown a table listing the current download counts for each song. With the information, the visitors were given the opportunity to download the songs that they liked. Unbeknownst to the visitors, upon arrival, the visitors were actually being assigned at random to one of different versions of the website. Those website versions started out identically, with the same songs, with each song having a download count of zero. In Group A, visitors were directed to the website on which they could see how previous participants' ratings of the songs, such as 679 people liked this song. But in Group B, the visitors cannot see the previous participants' song ratings. Over the time, 
would any difference in sound popularity on different versions of the websites? What were the experimental results? In the experiment, over 14,000 people came to different versions of the websites. Here were the major findings. First, across different versions of websites, there were a wide range of the popularity of sounds. Second, despite the wide range, the best sounds never ended up at the bottom, and the worst sounds never ended up at the top. The quality of sounds did play a role in popularity. Third, showing the visitors the download counts of the sounds influenced how newcomers make their decisions. Without such feedback, it is difficult for the newcomers to contribute to the rich get richer dynamics. But allowing newcomers to know the feedback before they make the judgment, you magnify the Matthew effect. One last question. Is it easy to set off an information cascade on social media? You may often hear something went viral, but in fact, most of the information that attempted cascade didn't spread at all on social media. In one study of 74 million cascading chains initiated by 1.6 million Twitter users, about 98% of the information did not spread at all. In this video, I introduced information cascade, threshold, and collective behavior. An information cascade has the potential to take place when people make decisions sequentially, with later people watching the actions of earlier people. A cascade then develops when people abandon their own information in favor of inferences based on earlier people's actions. I also introduced Mark Granovetta's riot model and Thomas Shalin's segregation model. Cascades can be wrong. It can spread the wrong idea or information, like the cascades in Shalin's model that leads to segregation. Cascades can also create a spiral of silence and no one is willing to speak up. Cascades can be based on little information. It is subject to the distribution of cascade and the social structure of social networks. Widespread cascade can be rare, like a majority of the information on social media does not go viral. At the initial state, it is helpful to have some super spreaders who can mimic a behavior and transmit the behavior to a bigger crowd. The bigger a crowd, the more likely that the behavior being picked up by someone who has a low threshold. Next week, we'll learn the theory of strength of weak ties.